it may be hard to understand how a behavior can be considered a disease. It's a mindset I'm guilty of having when I was younger. I mean, just stop being self-destructive, right? It seemed almost obvious. But when you learn the underlying causes of these behaviors, it's understandable to actually classify it as a disease and hopefully develop the appropriate response to such an issue. Substance abuse is a spectrum with the level of use plotted along it. Our own relationship with it is unique for each person. As someone more prone to this side of the spectrum, I've never felt the need or urge to use substances beyond scattered social occasions. For this reason, it's difficult to understand what people on this side of the spectrum feel and was the main reason for my inability to understand and properly empathize with them. So I'm not going to pretend like I know what it's like to have such a disease, because I couldn't possibly. But I will do my best to understand the actions and symptoms of it. On the most basic and superficial level, alcoholism is a genetic disorder. It's the result of improper gene expression. However, unlike normal genetic disorders, instead of being a flaw within the genome itself, alcoholism is caused by epigenetic factors. The symptoms of this improper gene expression can be cured with ethanol or alcohol consumption. This creates a strange disorder where improper gene expression causes the consumption of alcohol to fix this gene expression, but which then in turn causes more improper gene expression. Let's look into the mechanics of this. Your brain is stupidly complex. There are supposedly 80 to 90 billion neurons in your brain all switching on and off and somehow producing patterns that create you. It's not all random. Our brains develop specific tasks for specific neurons in specific regions. We're gonna focus on this little region here called the amygdala, the emotional processing region. Your amygdala dictates whether memories and sensations are positive or negative. And this is the region where neurologists suspect most of the impact from alcoholism occurs. Normally, brains have a specific balance of brain chemistry. That's just a broad term meaning the chemicals and proteins that make the brain go. Proteins that interact directly with neurons are called neurotransmitters. Their presence changes how neurons fire and thus alter patterns within your brain and subsequently how you feel and think. We're gonna focus on this neurotransmitter, neuropeptide Y. NPY has a bunch of different roles, but in the amygdala, NPY is like the chill out my dude neurotransmitter. The more neuropeptide Y that binds with neurons in the amygdala, the lower the sensation of anxiety. This is called an anxiolytic effect. A deficiency in neuropeptide Y binding creates an anxiogenic effect, and this is where the first half of alcoholism begins. If you've ever drank alcohol in moderation, you'll notice you tend to relax after a short while. Why is that? Neuropeptide Y doesn't appear out of thin air. It needs to be created, and the instructions to create it are hidden in your DNA. A strand of human DNA is about two meters in length, which is about 400,000 times the diameter of a neuron nucleus. So normally almost all of the DNA is tightly wrapped up around protein complexes called histones so as not to take up too much space. However, now that it is wrapped up, no one can get at the DNA within. Therefore, no useful proteins can be made from the DNA. In order to use the DNA, it needs to unravel a little bit. This is mediated through epigenetic processes. The one we are concerned with is called acetylation. Little proteins will come along and place acetyl groups on the histones for them to relax and unspool a bit of DNA. Now, regular transcribing of DNA can begin. But yin and yang exists everywhere, and just as histones can be acetylated, they can also be deacetylated, which causes them to constrict right back up. The presence of ethanol in the brain, by some yet unknown mechanism, stops the production and recruitment of histone deacetylases which means our hats can roam free acetylating to their heart's content and their work won't be undone. This causes the chromatin or DNA to relax and become easily available for transcription. One of the main hats in the amygdala, Kreb, happens to acetylate regions near the neuropeptide Y and neuropeptide Y receptor genes. So with acute alcohol consumption, 
we see a large increase in neuropeptide Y transcription and production in the amygdala producing the desired anxiolytic effect. After a while, the ethanol is metabolized and your amygdala goes, Whoa! What's with all these acetylated histones? HDATs, get in here and clean this mess up! And ideally, your brain goes back to normal. This happens because our brains and our bodies like stability, yin and yang, balance. However, with chronic alcohol abuse, eventually, somehow, your amygdala goes, Whoa, these histones and DNA are getting out of control. I need to hire more HDATs and DNMTs. Now, when our individual is no longer drinking, this now abundance of HDATs wind up the chromatin real tight to where very little DNA transcription can occur. So neuropeptide Y is no longer produced. On top of this, our amygdala has also recruited DNA methyltransferases, which are gene silencing proteins. These proteins roam around, and if they see an exposed CPG island, they may attach a methyl group to it. If this was a gene, it is now silenced and cannot be transcribed. Therefore, whatever protein it could have been now has one less place to produce it. This is the affliction of alcoholism. The lack of transcription due to histone deacetylation produces less neuropeptide Y. This causes a sensation of stress and anxiety, which compels an alcoholic to rebalance their brain chemistry by drinking. For them, alcohol restores their brain to a normal working fashion. On top of this, excess DNA methylation has certainly silenced many genes. However, the research of which genes and how they affect the user are not well known, but it is well documented that chronic alcohol intake increases DNMT activity. This second phenomenon is of more interest, as we can treat rats with HDAC inhibitors to reduce anxiety and restore alcohol consumption back to mostly normal levels. But DNA methylation is a more permanent consequence, and this is what should be considered most when concerning adolescent alcohol abuse. It's experimentally and anecdotally observed that for some still not quite understood reason, Adolescents in multiple species are less sensitive to the effects of alcohol than adults. It's hypothesized that this is due to the underdeveloped neurotransmitter system of youth, but it's not confirmed. Despite this, there exists a strong correlation between alcohol abuse as an adolescent and alcohol consumption as an adult, despite not exhibiting normal alcoholic traits. It may be a cause from leftover methylations on the DNA from binge drinking as an adolescent. The presence of alcohol reduces DNA methylation. So perhaps this causes the urge to drink for those with elevated methylation of their neural DNA. However, this area of research needs more work. In closing, alcoholism really is a genetic disorder or disease. For them, the presence of alcohol creates balanced brain chemistry. It almost seems cruel to expect a person to heal themselves without some form of medication. I was curious as to why HDAC inhibitors aren't a common treatment for humans and found that all the papers referencing HDAC treatment on rats are less than six years old. So maybe this can be a potential solution in the future to help those afflicted by this disorder. Either way, I hope you've developed a bit of understanding and empathy for what some people may have to deal with.